Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch. I'm your host, Vikas Swaroop. In this week's episode, we will talk about an aspect of diplomacy that receives relatively less attention, but is crucial to promoting a country's interests as well as fostering international goodwill. Let me begin with a few historical notes. In 1946, the United States Senate introduced legislation proposed by James William Fulbright and made history by establishing the world's first international educational exchange platform, the Fulbright Program, which now operates in more than 150 countries and has facilitated over 250,000 educational and cultural exchanges abroad. In 1956, in Lugano, Switzerland, the first Eurovision contest took place with the idea of creating a TV song contest that would be broadcast to all European countries. It has now been recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest running annual TV music competition. In the early 60s, a handful of French-speaking countries in Africa hosted the Friendship Games sports event. It soon expanded to become the All Africa Games with nations from all over Africa sending the best of their athletic talent to compete. On the 6th of April, 1971, an American ping pong team was invited to visit China, becoming the first group of Americans to be allowed into the country after the communists took over in 1949. It eventually led to the restoration of Sino-US relations, which had been cut for more than two decades. On September 27, 2014, during his speech at the UN General Assembly, Prime Minister Narendra Modi put forth his suggestion for the United Nations to declare June 21 as the International Day of Yoga. The draft resolution proposed by India was then endorsed by a record 177 member states. The first International Day of Yoga was observed around the world on June 21, 2015 and has become a regular occurrence ever since. So what is the common thread linking all these events? They are all considered successful examples of cultural diplomacy. And that will be the focus of our episode tonight. We are living in an increasingly globalized world where distance and space have almost disappeared and we are in daily contact with diverse cultures. In such an environment, it becomes all the more important to create a favorable context for a global intercultural dialogue. And the best way to do it is through cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy is the exchange of arts, ideas, information, and other aspects of culture in order to foster mutual understanding. Several countries have set up institutions dedicated to the pursuit of cultural diplomacy. Britain has its British councils, France its network of Alliance Francais, the Chinese have Confucius Institutes, the United States has American centers, the Germans have Goethe Institutes, the Spanish have Instituto Cervantes, and India has the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, or ICCR. Cultural diplomacy is also used to promote a country's soft power, which is the ability of a country to influence the behavior or thinking of others through the power of ideas and attraction. For centuries, foreigners were attracted to Indian culture, its traditions of mysticism and spirituality, as well as to Indian spices like pepper, cloves, cardamom, and cinnamon. In the modern era, India's status as the world's largest democracy, its dynamic economy and strides in science and technology, its vibrant dance, music, art, and film scene, and the growing popularity of Indian cuisine have created a new narrative for brand India and increased India's soft power. So how are we leveraging these trends and what are we doing to promote brand India abroad? To discuss this, I have three outstanding practitioners of cultural diplomacy as my guests. Ambassador Dinesh Patnaik is a career diplomat with over 25 years of experience. He has served as India's ambassador to Cambodia and Morocco and is currently the Director General of the Indian Council of Cultural Relations. Acharya Pratishtha is a very well-known face in the field of yoga. She became the youngest yogacharya in 2007. She was posted as director of India's largest cultural center in Mauritius and as yoga and Kathak guru at Indian cultural centers in Johannesburg and Jakarta. She has hosted television shows on yoga, authored five books, and given more than 6,000 hours of lectures. And joining us from Mumbai is actor Adil Hussain, who is well known for his work in both Indian films 
and international projects like The Reluctant Fundamentalist, Life of Pi, Star Trek Discovery Season 3, and What Will People Say, for which he received the Norwegian National Award. He was recognized for his work in Mukti Bhavan and Maj Rati Ketiki at the National Film Awards in 2017, and has won Best Actor Awards recently in Berlin and Washington, D.C. Let me begin with you, Ambassador Patnaik. Now, culture is a very vast concept, and it is said that you can find 164 definitions of culture alone. So tell me, which specific aspects of culture does ICCR deal with? We deal with all aspects of culture, Vikas. But let me at the outset before beginning tell you that culture is a dynamic concept. And when we're talking about cultural relations, we're talking about exchanges, intermingling, working together. Because cultural relations are about give and take. It's not about a one-way process of sending culture abroad. So what ICCR does is take Indian culture to the world and also take the foreign culture, the world culture to Indians. Because that's the only way a country becomes big. Like I've always maintained, Culture does not clash, people clash. And so cultures bring people together. So if you can bring people together, that's the best way. And that's ICCR's mandate, which is uh, mutual understanding, creating cultural relations and mutual understanding. So what do we do? We do everything. I mean, we do performing arts in a ma major way, music, dance, theater, cinema, art, visual arts, painting, literature, poetry, you name it. I mean, everything, textiles, clothing, we do everything. And what do we do? We do performances, shows, and events across the world, well curated, high quality, because we take the best of India abroad. But that's what everybody wants to see, the best of India abroad. And that we do. We participate in international festivals. We do bilateral programs. But one of the main dimensions that we do is academic exchanges. Because at the end of the day, ICCR started with the Ministry of Education. It's only when they realized how powerful soft power is that it was moved in 1970s from the Ministry of Education to the Ministry of External Affairs. But academic exchanges is at the crux of everything. Uh, we have, today I was calculating, we have more than 100,000 students who have studied in India. Wow. Every year we give about 3,500 scholarships. At any given time, there are 8,000 students studying in India. So there are numbers are very big. And this alumni network is extremely strong. These are the future leaders in these countries, future ambassadors of India. And tomorrow in the future, when we look for allies across the world, these are the people who understand India. I mean, I always give this example of UK. I mean, we became independent of UK, but we never harbored any resentment against them because all our leaders after independence had studied in the UK. We just launched something called the Gen Next Democracy Network, which is to create a network of democratic countries around the world where young leaders, aspiring emerging leaders who are going to become future leaders of that country, come to India to get a glimpse of democracy, of how we are structuring ourselves, how we are conducting ourselves at the central level, state level, governance, uh, the local government level, at every level. So the idea is to take democracy, which is an in, inbuilt part of our culture. Prime Minister Modi said at the UN that India is the mother of democracy. And the whole idea is how do we show the world the strength of ours? Because this is one of our greatest strengths. I mean, the people we compete across, many of them are not even democracies, and you know what I'm talking about. But one of the last things I wanted to add before you finish, which you started off, which Prime Minister Modi announcing the UN, the International Day of Yoga, in 2014 and from 2015 we've been doing, ICCR is the lead of doing yoga abroad. We not only celebrate the International Day of Yoga in a big way, we also do yoga with Ayurveda, with the Ministry of Ayush. We also are now doing um, certification of yoga trainers and yoga practitioners so that we can actually tell them what is the right way of doing yoga. Tell me, as Director General of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, what do you see as the opportunities and the challenges of uh, India's cultural diplomacy? Opportunities are huge. Actually, frankly speaking, we, the world is our oyster. We, there's so much we can do. There is no country in the world which has the range and the variety of cultural assets that we have. Nobody. I mean, look at the dance forms, the music forms, theatre, you know, textiles, uh, painting, everything. We're huge. Our weakness always has been packaging. Mm. How do you package it? We still don't have a running Broadway show or a running Western show or shows which blaze you. Bollywood does it, but not classical music, dance, etc. So packaging has been a weakness in everything that we do. And so we need to work on that. So that's a huge challenge. The other is in academics. We need to create an ecosystem in India which actually gives forth higher academic exchanges because the world, if you want to be a Vishwa Guru, we have to do it at home. Prime Minister Modi wants India to be a hub for education, international education in the world. But for that, we need an ecosystem 
which can accept and know how to treat foreign students. We are still not very good. So there are many such things that are there in the anvil. But I will tell you one thing. All of government is working together to ensure that we can project our soft power in the best way possible. Acharya Pratishtha ji, now DG ICCR mentioned yoga. And of course, it is one of the greatest gifts of ancient India to the world. It is estimated that approximately 300 million people worldwide practice yoga on a daily basis. So tell us, why and how did the world embrace yoga? Well, uh, I think um, yogis and mystics had been teaching, promoting and propagating yoga since ages. Not only ancient yogis, even the modern yogis, Swami Bharat Bhushanji, who is the first Padma Vadi, initiated International Festival of Yoga back in 1990 uh, with participation from so many countries, BK Sayangarji, so many other contemporaries. But we cannot deny this fact that recognition to any particular art or particular field is being given by the people in power. And we are fortunate that we have such people in power today who know that there are treasures from their culture which can be used as tools of soft diplomacy. Uh, I would say it was back in 1893 when one Narendra went to Chicago and gave the message of universal brotherhood, peace and yoga, that world started embracing yoga. And then it was in 2015, that Narendra is known as Swami Vivekanand. Another Narendra went to UN in 2015 and gave the gift of International Day of Yoga. And that was the moment when people started embracing yoga with broader hands, broader hearts and broader heads. And the answer to why is, world is suffering today. Whether it be physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, financial problems, yoga is the only cure to all the ailments and sorrows of life. Uh, we had re realized this during the pandemic, that there is a huge search for spirituality in the world today. True. Huge search for a purpose of life. Uh, the pandemic made people feel that, you know, what is the purpose of my life? I mean, a small virus can okay. affect it. So what ICCR has recently done, which we've initiated, is to bring all the spiritual organization, yoga and spiritual organizations across together. the country together on one platform. Because we were surprised when we did the research that there are more than 60 organizations in India which have thousands of centers yes. abroad. Correct. And it has happened without the government ever getting into it. So we don't want to be a barrier to that, but we want to put everybody together on a platform so that we can give to the world, which has been our heritage and our legacy for thousands of years. So it is something which is part of the way the vaccine maitri worked. Is the same way, give spirituality to the world, a solace to the world at the time of pandemic. So these are the many things ICCR is doing. So ICCR has united them because the word, actual meaning of yoga is to, unite. to unite. Yeah. So tell us, how significant was the step that Prime Minister Modi took when he asked the United Nations yes. to declare June 21 as the International Day of Yoga? Uh, I think I'm fortunate enough to be a part of several yoga committees of Government of India. And significance is very, very clear to give United Nations its true meaning, you know, uh, without even going into the deeper definitions of yoga, even the translation of the word is to unite. In the English mark sheet, we see total, sum, yeah. un when we unite them, in the Hindi mark sheet, it's yoga. So today, when world is scattered, when nations are scattered, when people are scattered, we need a science to unite people, to unite nations, to unite uh, world because it was at the time of declaration of International Day of Yoga, we gave a very strong message and a very clear message to the world that we are a country of peace. We are a country of Vasudheva Kutumbakam, universal brotherhood. We are a country of Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinehe. We talk about the wellness of everyone and that was a gift from India through our representative, Sri Narendra Modi ji, to the world for all of us to unitedly make this world a better place. Adalji, coming to you now, on my first posting abroad in Turkey, I discovered that almost every Turk I met knew about Raj Kapoor and the song Avarahu. During my posting in Addis Ababa, every time my car would come out of the compound, I heard I had Ethiopian street kids running after it singing Hindi film songs without knowing a word of Hindi. So what is it about Indian films that makes them so popular abroad, despite the barriers of language and culture? 
I think that uh, what uh, both the panelists are saying, that the gentleness that we have, the kind of warmth that Indian people possess and the cultural expression or the expression of the inner state of being through artistic activities, films, paintings, like when I hear classical singing, of uh, recently I had been hearing a lot of Uday Bhavalkarji of Dhrupad. <clears throat> and when I hear it in the morning and I go, my heart melts, my I become tender, I become soft. And that had been there since thousands of years in India, as I have read Rig Veda or the Yoga Patanjali's Yoga Sutra <clears throat> and the great saints of India, right from uh, you know, uh, Ramakrishna Paramahansa Devarshi, Aurobindo, Ramana Maharshi. So all these amazing people uh, have probably brought together the higher uh, aspirations of human beings in India. And we knowingly or unknowingly, we have it within. And it's very easily accessible. Uh, we have a defense mechanism. I know that we try to, uh, you know, be in this cutthroat uh, world, you know, the cutthroat competition. I don't like that word, but it's because it feels terrible to say cutthroat and you don't cut anybody's throat to, you know, to, to, to surpass that person. But the inherent warmth and beauty and tenderness and, uh, and, and, and the ability to accommodate and, and accept and embrace the other, and that other could be anything, a human being, nature, or or anything else that is there even in the films that we make there is this there's this um, aesthetics that we probably practice knowingly or unknowingly and the character that they, that we write, the kind of uh, narrative that we have, that easily uh, touches people. It penetrates the the the, the superficial defense mechanism, even uh, in countries like which has nothing to do with India, uh, uh, so to say. And it touches. Like when I landed in in Egypt for the first time in my life in 1999, I went there with a play called Othello, a play in black and white. We were performing there, and uh, as I got into the taxi and the taxi driver asked me, uh, where are you from? I said, India. Oh, Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> he just jumped out of like, I said, I'm not Amitabh Bachchan. I just, you know, my name is Adil Hussain. I have come here to do a play. Is the Hindi films or the Indian cinema distills the best of India into one screen. So you have the best of music, dance, uh, emotions, what he talked about the feelings of people, the simplicity of the people, all things distilled onto one screen. Complete and package. Complete package. And that attracted a people across the world. So I find it a beautiful device to portray India in the best of its forms. Adalji, you have worked in international films like Life of Pi and The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Currently, of course, uh, your uh, series is running uh, Star Trek Discovery Season 3. So this, I find, is a very new phenomenon where more and more international projects are featuring Indian actors. So what has changed in the last decade or so? I think that uh, as the Indian diaspora is getting into the mainstream fabric of a particular country or society and they are being looked at and their contributions are being recognized by the people there, the local people, those who are there from uh, for some time. And they're being written into the scripts now and, and, and uh, they're being recognized that they are uh, contributing. They are very, very vibrant um, contributors to the society and they are they are being now written into the script and also the fact that uh, the 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 reason most of the time that we don't see longer or uh, important indian characters are being written also that um, the acting styles are very different here you know in india we have generally a bit larger than life um, acting style and the genre of acting is different. But nowadays, because as, as you have seen that things are coming together because of uh, technological advancement and all that, now the actors have also learned how to do so-called uh, re realistic acting or naturalistic acting. And that's how probably the casting directors, the directors, they are recognizing the Indian actors and they are casting them in different kinds of roles. Ambassador Patnaik, the COVID-19 pandemic has destroyed lives and livelihoods, but perhaps the sector that has been most badly impacted 
has been that of the performing arts, with live events no longer possible, venues closed, and large gatherings banned. So what creative ways did ICCR find to continue promoting Indian culture even during the pandemic? Well, we did a lot of things during the pandemic. I mean, but mainly we had to go online because that's the only way to reach people. You saw how OTT platforms did excellently well during COVID-19. So we went on to platforms. We created our own social media platforms. We worked with other OTT platforms. We basically wanted to bring culture to the people. People were seeing movies, theatres, everything online. And so we decided to send them culture. So we did painting competitions online. We did our classes, dance classes, music classes online. So everything went online till we reached a stage where we had to go hybrid because things started opening up. And now when things are opening up completely, I feel we are not going to ever let go of the hybrid system because mm -hmm. what we found during the pandemic is that while your off-site or on-site programs are very good, the reach of online is tremendous. Right. And so that, so we have decided now that because of the pandemic, but one of the other things we did during the pandemic is we looked at cultural issues which bring solace to people. So talks, spirituality, mm. yoga, the amount of yoga online that has gone after pandemic is huge. So these are the things we tapped into. But at the end of the day, even our uh, tapping is small. What we acted as was a catalyst. We acted as catalyst for others to do things. Adalji, you are currently shooting in Mumbai for a new film because restrictions have eased. But how was the film industry impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? And will we see a return of audiences to pre-pandemic levels or is there going to be a new normal? Um, I think people are coming back to see uh, movies on big screen. I think we are very social. We are, you know, social species and we like to... Uh, watching a movie is not only watching a movie, it's also mingling with people and and to get to be able to see with each other. Uh, I was surprised that when Bell Bottom was released in cinema halls, uh, a film that I acted in, uh, Akshay Kumar plays the lead in that. And uh, I was a bit worried that, okay, will people come and watch? And But they did. They all came out and watched it in spite of the fear of, uh, you know, um, uh, COVID-19. I think I think people are coming out and watching the movies and the impact was uh, terrible. A uh, lot of people went out of work. A uh, lot of actors, those who were not like big actors, when I say big actors means they were not paid well. Uh, they had suffered a lot. A lot of theater actors have suffered a lot. I mean, I'm sure that the, um, the Director General of ICCR would uh, be very aware of uh, what kind of impact, especially the dancers, musicians, um, the Germany uh, being a country announced 3 point some 2 billion, 2 billion euros for the artist. I don't know yet if Indian government has done that uh, for dancers and, you know, theater actors, ac uh, actors or painters, sculptors across the country. I would like to uh, know about that if he could reply to uh, these questions because I'm unaware of that. Um, the film industry has somehow survived, but uh, the the trouble was most visible amongst the crew members. Those were, those were daily wages, you know, the light boys and the, and the spot boys and people, those who catered uh, food to the film industry. They were the, the worst victims of uh, COVID-19, I think. Acharya Pratishalji, you have been a part of Indian cultural centers abroad. How important a role do they play in disseminating Indian art and culture? And what has been the reaction of foreign audiences? Uh, it won't be an exaggeration if I would say culture center is a place from where you promote and propagate your culture, but also a place from where you can see a perspective of a common man of a country and people in power. Art is something, as long as we are alive, we have emotions. As long as we have emotions, we have art in us. I'll just give you a very small example to just sum up this answer. During one of my deputations, uh, I could find out interest of the president of that country in theater during one of the official meetings. So I just discussed something about theater and he was so happy that he proposed, let's do a grand production together. So he wrote the entire dance drama. I conceptualized it and I made my staff perform, choreograph, compose it, taking the local artists. Along with other so many benefits we had out of that drama, I could see a different perspective of the people in power towards my country, which helped us a lot in maintaining the relationship of both countries.
culture centers had always played a key role in bringing people and nations together which is very very important okay we are running out of time so your final thoughts in 30 seconds or less on what can we do to promote brand india on a broader scale ambassador patnaik big shows we have to think big up till now we have been thinking small we need a western production a broadway production we need to reach out across the world the confucius centers of china spend 10000 crores a year we spend about 300 crores a year the scope is immense acharya pradesh ji i think by breaking the stereotypes today uh, our government has taken an initiative to bring experts of different fields two different fields biggest example is our honorable em who is not a, from a political background still heading a ministry because he is an expert of that i think doors of diplomacy needs to be open to people from different fields experts with administrative background adil ji so i think that nfdc national film development corporation should be empowered with lot of funding i think they get 30 crores per, per year i think it should not should be at least 300 crore if not 3000 crore uh, to scout out new filmmakers from across the country especially from the northeast part of the country and and so, southern part of the country they are not they are not being getting this amazing platforms that nfdc could offer and uh, encourage them to write great scripts uh, in you know inclusive scripts of how indian culture is uh, so 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 profound and and make great films and uh, and and exhibit exhibit them throughout the world a very big thank you to my three panelists it is clear from the comments that india's cultural diplomacy is thriving and will continue to make new forays and foster new friendships that is all i have for you tonight join me next week for another episode of diplomatic dispatch till then good evening and goodbye